Hello, members. Tom Morrison here at the Home Office of the Metal Trading Institute in Nashville, Tennessee. We're here to talk specifications. Things have been changed in NADCAP, AMEX, CQI9. They're all moving and shaking, and it's imperative that you're here, and we're glad you are to listen in and see what's going on in the world of specifications. So a couple of quick notes before we get into our leaders talking about those issues is on the bottom, you'll see a chat box that you can click, and it'll pop up on your right. If there's any questions or comments, sometimes members will answer other members' questions. If there's any comments or questions you have, Type them in the chat box at the bottom and a pop up. If you take a look over there right now, I've put where's everyone listening from. So if you want to practice a little, type in the city and state that you're listening from so we can hear and see who, who's listening in. Um, a couple of big things I want to make note of is MTI's board approved um, what we call our purchase order checklist form that everyone needs to download. If you go out to MTI's website at heatreat.net um, and then go to the industry links tab, the very first thing you're going to see is the purchase order form. And what that is, it's a template for you to give to every one of your customers that have kind of a laundry list of all the general things that you'd ever want to see on a purchase order. And there's a two-minute video there that you can download and put on your website or send to your customers so that you can at least work together to try and create less time trying to run around looking for specs for what you need, what their requirements are. It's really a great checklist that was developed by a group of heat treaters. So you want to check that out as a great resource. And the last thing before we get into the specification is Furnaces North America 2022, man. It is coming in like 60 days. I looked on my website with the countdown clock and it scared me because I saw 60 days. We're going to have 125 exhibitors of all the top suppliers you in one place can come and engage and look in and see what's the latest technology and trends and processes going on in the world of heat treat. And there's 35 technical sessions with some big experts going to give you the latest in automation, cleaning, um, phoretic nitro carburizing, there's all kinds of good things happening. So you don't want to miss that. It's going to be in Indianapolis, Indiana on October 3rd to the 5th. And if you want to get into that show, you can go to furnacesnorthamerica.com and enjoy the excitement that that's all going to bring to the table. But today we're here to talk specific. It's been about three or four months, I think, since we've been together. And welcome everybody. We've got Ed, Bob, Joanna, and, uh, and, and Stephen Keckler. And I'm glad you're all here. So um, right now, we're going to start with the big CQI-9 thing, Bob Ferry. What's going on in the world of CQI-9? Yeah, well, uh, CQI-9 is um, it's pretty quiet right now. We do have some questions that come in, um, you know, dribs and drabs of questions. Um, you know, as people are going through their uh, CQI-9 uh, checklists and their audit, and um, so we do get some questions from time to time that we address uh, independently. Uh, we're still meeting on a quarterly basis with the whole committee. Uh, however, if a question comes in, we'll do breakout section sessions uh, to try to get a response for uh, whoever sent the question in so that they get some immediate response. They don't have to wait for the quarter to go by before we answer them. Um, and then we, we also bring it back up again at the committee meeting to ensure, you know, make sure that we're all on the same page and we're all seeing things the same way. So, um, so that's how the um, uh, CQI9 committee is operating right now. Uh, we're excited that, um, you know, we're not getting a huge amount of questions or problems. So it kind of indicates that you, you did okay with the spec. Uh, and then the points that were uh, addressing are just points that we're clarifying um, in order to make sure that, again, the spec comes out clearer, not only in our language, but in uh, you know languages all over the world, that it can get translated properly. So uh, next committee meeting is going to be September uh, 15th in, um, and that's kind of what we're waiting for on the committee meeting, unless we get contacted from questions coming in. So, uh, so far we're still holding, holding steady. So Bob, I got a big question for you. Never asked this on this forum, but I think it's worthy of note. Um, I mean, I know we addressed a little bit on NADCAP, but if someone's not doing automotive or in the work with CQI9, I mean, where's the best place for them to take those steps to check it out and figure out what, what's required to, to be in that business, that industry? So, um, I mean, you can go on the AIAG website and uh, they do have um, uh, access to heat treaters and CQI-9 um, documents. Uh, they also provide, um, they may, I should take a look at that. I think they provide training for uh, CQI-9, but you can, you can purchase a document 
Um, and again, it's a self assessment. So the document's going to have like a checklist of questions that it's going to ask as an auditor would. And, um, and you can just go through that, that assessment just to see how you um, measure up to what automotive is requiring uh, for heat treaters or recommending that heat treaters um, be at this, this level. Um, Cause it's minimum requirements, right? Right. So um, that's, that's where you would go is the uh, AIAG. Uh, that's the automotive industry um, group. A action group. Action group, right. Is it AIAG.org um, or .com? I think it's .com. Okay. Yeah, I'll double check that. I'll check it out while you finish up. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I think uh, you just go on there and, and they'll be able to help you with that. And, and as I mentioned before, AIEG is involved in more than just heat treat um, issues. They also have a, um, you know, a plating uh, specification. I think I got about 12 different CQI uh, documents uh, that, that relate to different um, industries. So, um, yeah, that's a good resource for anybody that's involved in automotive. Because again, it was created by the by the big three. They got together and and um, and kind of commingled their specifications uh, that they were auditing people to to create this CQI nine document um, that they they pretty much collaborate on to make sure that it's applicable for automotive in general and right. not just one specific company. Right. Awesome. Well, anything else uh, regarding AIG? No, that's about it for right now. Okay. Uh, until September comes around. All right. Well, cool. Well, so now we're going to move into something that affects just probably every heat treater, and that's ASTM with pardon specs and stuff. So, so I know Stephen Keckler and Ed Inghart, both of you are on top of a lot of what's going on there. So I just, I'll throw it to Stephen first. Uh, and Bob, you can chime in anytime you, you want to. But Stephen, what's going on in the world of ASTM? Sure. So uh, I'll hit the highlight notes, mostly involving the hardness testing stuff going on. I'll leave uh, the pyrometry stuff, I think, to Ed. I think he did a little better notes than I did on that part. Um, but before I, I get into the actual changes, I just want to, to make a kind of a note on this, because I, I find a lot of people don't actually know this, is that ASTM doesn't dictate an adoption period. As far as ASTM is concerned, once the spec is published, it's active. Um, the people you need to look at for how fast or slow you need to worry about being and adopting it, that's going to be your customers or your certifiers, such as like NAGCAP. They're, they're, going, to, they're going to be the people ultimately who tell you, you need to be like compliant within X period. So with that cherry little side note um, completed, so probably the big ticket item right now is E18 is a, has been revised is live and available from purchase, both from ASTM's website as well as your third party vendor of choice. Um, the big takeaways on it are the stuff we've been talking about for going on a little over a year now, which is that it is now stated in E18, just like it is in E140 and some other specs that you need to report your conversions. So if you're inspecting one scale, but reporting another, you need to report what your original scale was, what that value was, as well as your converted value and the convert scale. And then additionally, above and beyond that, um, you need to be reporting if you do are doing convex curvature corrections. And if you're doing that correction and you're not using the tables they give you in E18, you need to state where that table came from. Um, most of us are probably using the standard Annex A6 table, but some of us, I'm sure, are using other sources. So just make sure you're up on where your stuff's coming from and making sure your reports actually state that. Um, some upcoming stuff that's in the works. Um, E10, so that's Brunel, and then E92, that's Macro Vickers, are going to be getting kind of the same treatment where they're both going to have in plain text state that you need to report when you're doing conversions. And then E92 as well is going to have statements on, on the requirement that you need to report when you're doing curvature correction. 
Um, kind of a bigger picture thing, and this is probably going to take quite a bit longer to roll out because it's outside of just E26 committee, is there, there's going to probably end up being a push to where all of your certs, all of your reports are going to have to state what spec your inspection or inspections were coming from. Um, who knows what the timeline for that is. Some specs might get more of a fight from that than others. Um, but you're going to be looking at like uh, A956, E384, E92, E10, E18. Um, I forget the one, the other kind of common one that the steel people control. Um, currently, the only spec that actually states this is E110. So if you are testing with portables in accordance with E110, might not be a bad idea just to make sure your reports actually state that you're doing that. It's already a kind of a requirement. It's an easy one to miss, but it is there. Um, additionally, E92 is going to be getting some revisions to clarify some areas. This actually hopefully will, should be a good improvement. It's not really a substantive change which you need to do. It's more going to be clarifications on like, what the intent of these statements already were. And then E110 is currently having a precision bias study done. And depending on what the outcome of that precision bias study is, it may not be a big deal. It may be kind of a nothing burger. Um, but if the results are substantially different than what's in E10 and E18, that could lead to some interesting conversations. But um, for now, it's kind of just wait and see until we get the finished data. Um, tangentially, tangentially, tangentially related. Say that, that say, that slow, say that slow, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you're doing inspection to ISO specs, uh, specifically 6507 for Vickers or 6508 for Rockwell, they're under active revision. I really don't have more to offer you than the comment that they are under revision. Um, and then we get into thermocouples, but I think I'm going to leave that to Ed because he can probably speak to that better than I can. So I'll throw it to you, Ed. That's E20 committee, right? Correct. That's, uh, yeah, that, that's E20. Yeah. Yeah, that would be E20 committee. Yeah. Uh, as far as the practical effect on heat treaters, there's probably not a lot happening here. Uh, thermocouples are pretty well established as sensors and have been standardized for many years. Uh, there is a, a effort underway to bring uh, type C, which is tungsten, tungsten rhenium, into back into the standard of E230. And there's a lot of discussion on uh, trying to develop standards for ultra high temperature uh, thermocouples. Um, there's getting to be uh, more and more interest in a very high temperature processing, and there's not a lot of uh, good standard thermocouple types that uh, are, uh, are supported for use at temperatures. And we're talking above 2400 Fahrenheit uh, for some of these processes. So, uh, but really on the uh, heat treater side, uh, as a practical thing, I don't see anything uh, on the horizon that's going to be uh, particularly impactful. Uh, there's a lot of discussion going around the, the qualification and classification of the insulator materials used in mineral insulated uh, metal sheet thermocouples. That's more for the folks that are making them and how they uh, classify them. Uh, probably day to day, you're just going to continue ordering whatever it is you've been ordering in the past and uh, nothing much will change uh, that you'll observe uh, at, the, uh, at the day to day heat treat end of it. So there's, a, there's more work going underway, like I say, in these high temperature thermocouples. And uh, I, I don't see any other big changes on the horizon there. Did, did, can you think of anything, uh, Steve? That, you know, uh, yeah, the only other thing I think I would add is uh, it, there was some pretty serious discussion about trying to get type D thermocouples rated for a lower cryogenic temperature, which uh, for some of us that could be awfully helpful. Yeah. Um, I know some of us are running some pretty significant issues due to lack of options at this stage. And then uh, 
And perhaps I misheard, but I also uh, was under the impression that they're looking to add type D to the standardized letter listings as well. Yeah. And then uh, actually, I guess I do have one more note. Um, is there was some amount of conversation about uh, AMAC getting, trying to get, or sorry, uh, E20 trying to get feedback from AMAC um, about some revision stuff to help bring things in line between each other. Yeah, there, there were some table misalignments uh, in the last rounds of 2750 that uh, I think they got rectified in G and uh, the uh, E20 committee is looking for some kind of uh, more active engagement with the AMEC uh, team that handles 2750. And I've offered a couple times to help act as a communication go between. So I'm trying to get to these E20 meetings as regularly as I can to uh, both take and bring back information. So I think that's really about it. Well, I have a question. So in line with the same philosophy of in the world of NADCAP and AMEC, where they started changing specs and the change in technology got down to where you could get it down to a tenth of a degree. So, I mean, I think about hardness testers in the world of hardness testers. Is there changes in specs or in hardness technique technology or processor trends that you think are worthy of heat treaters talking about or at least looking at um, within the op operations or is it just all, all just status quo? Uh, I'd say it's more or less status quo. I, I can tell you that at, on the E20 committee, uh, they were all, they, then they still are not of the same mind about this tenth of a degree requirement uh, for readability in, uh, in the uh, AS, uh, AM, uh, AMS 2750 process instrumentation requirement. They're, they're almost baffled as to why it has to be. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and these are people who are pretty much experts in the field of uh, pyrometry and temperature measurement. Um, but uh, that's the only comment I've gotten out of that. I don't see the same thing happening in hardness testing with a, some big push to drive things to right. a finer level right. of measurement. Do you, Steve? Uh, I would say the only thing that's sort of tangentially related to that, it would be uh, there is some lack of cohesion within the committee over the acceptability of portables and under what condition they shouldn't shouldn't be reportable. Um, and that's that is probably going to become be an ongoing argument for I think quite some time. I don't I don't think that's going to really be resolved in any sort of short order. Awesome. That sounds good. I just I just wanted to ask the question just in case there's something out there that you know you go, you know what, they should really be thinking about this because you never know when specs and technology start to cross hairs. Yeah. No, and there is a there is an effort underway from the oil and gas people to change or modify ASTM E140, which is conversion of hardness values from one right. uh, scale to another. They're looking at the uh, age hardening nickel based alloys and martensitic stainlesses, especially in the lower strength levels where they use these materials all the time. Uh, and the they don't have what they feel were good tables in E140 for conversions. So that's probably, I don't know, they're, they're doing their inner laboratory study work now. Uh, and uh, they, they showed some charts and graphs showing correlations, uh, the amount of scatter that they were experiencing. And they're trying to uh, mathematically rectify some of that to uh, distill it into a usable table. Uh, it'll probably get published maybe in 2023. And I don't know how many people affects on this call, uh, but if you're in the oil and gas business and you're doing Martin Siddick stainlesses and pH stainless, uh, pH uh, nickel-based alloys, keep an eye out for uh, a revised D140. The, the other place where those table changes will show up is A370. Right, yep. Um, so if... If by some insane chance you're not using E140 for your conversions and you're relying on A370, have no fear, it will be there as well. Yeah. You heard it first right here, right? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, Stephen, Ed, thank y'all so much for, uh, for that update. That's great. I'm sure everybody got a lot of that. So next on the agenda is our great world of the people who write the rules for aerospace, AMEX. So I'll throw it to Ed. I'll let you kind of drive that discussion. What's going on there? 
So uh, AMEC, um, their uh, AMS 2801 Rev C is finally at Aerospace Council for their vote. I'm hoping it's a rubber stamp and that it gets published uh, before the end of the year. Uh, we had our last meeting in uh, uh, Port Huron, Michigan, hosted by uh, the Venerable Robert Peters. I, don't, I haven't seen him on this call yet, but uh, Robert and ALD hosted the meeting. Uh, it went pretty well. Uh, actually, very little uh, fireworks or sparks flying about on that one, uh, so it, was, it went smoothly. 2750G, as we're all aware, did get published. So uh, it's really, if you were compliant with F, you should have little or no trouble being in compliance with G because it was essentially clarifications, fixing of mistakes and errors, and uh, improved language in places. So do take a look, though. Make sure there's nothing hiding in there that might jump out and get you uh, so that uh, your system stay uh, safe and compliant from... Uh, auditor mishaps. The, uh, uh, the rest of the work, let's see, we got 2750 slash one and two for, um, let's see, hipping and, um, oh, uh, the uh, composites, the uh, CFC auto cleaning. Uh, yeah, there, um, there were some, the initial round for the autoclave people hit AMEC and was very roundly shot down, uh, which left them to go back and lick their wounds. They were not happy with uh, the way uh, um, those comments went. I put in a lot of commentary regarding the uh, apparent lack of traceability of thermocouples and their uses, number of uses and whatnot. That was not received well by them because they had really no provision for it. And uh, there were a variety of comments in there that uh, left them uh, having to go back to reconsider their positions. Uh, Hipping, I don't think is out yet. We're, we know there's a sub team working on it um, and uh, it hasn't come back to uh, AMEC for the first round of commentary. So that's pretty much the story on 2750. Uh, 2801, there, there, there's a parking lot set up for some of the 2759 um, specs. So if you have issues with it and you want to see them get fixed in the next go around, uh, please contact me or go to SAE and, and uh, contact them at AMEC. And we'll, uh, we'll make sure that those desired changes get into the um, parking lot for the next revision. So uh, unless you have any other comments, I really, for the most part, that was what I found at AMEC. In the coming up, the various metals committees, uh, B, D, F, and G, E, F, and G are meeting in Albuquerque in uh, September. I'm expecting to go out there because uh, I know 2801 is going to have some commentary that I'll have to deal with. And uh, there's always questions about 2750. So I'm gonna see if I can get out there and join that meeting um, when it occurs. And the next uh, AMEC meeting is what, November in uh, Fort Myers, is that yeah, right? November, November 2nd, 3rd and 4th, and I'll be hosting that meeting in Fort Myers. Yeah, I'll be, uh, the ASTM meeting is also committee is that week. So that's in New Orleans. I'll, probably go to that and then hop over to Fort Myers to do the uh, AMEC meeting and then head home. So yeah, a lot of got going on in October. I don't know if you all are aware, you got FNA, you've got the uh, course NADCAP. Yeah. And then uh, ASTM metals committees, AMEC is meeting. And uh, <laughs> if you were in the world of AS 13,100, they're also meeting the week of FNA in Indianapolis, by the way. So uh, I suspect there'll be a handful of us that go to FNA for a couple of days and then hop over to the AS 13,100 meeting uh, that Rolls-Royce is sponsoring uh, that same week. Mm. A lot going on for sure. That is for sure. Any, 
anybody got anything else on on the AMAC committee? And, and Robert, I mean, Ed, do you want to mention though? I didn't didn't some I see something across the email ARP thirteen forty one or something that thirteen ninety one that was coming across. Yeah, they're so going to be opening 13, up. Yeah, so uh, you know, there's this, there's various methods by which you can check surface contamination in AMS twenty seven fifty nine. It's not as prescriptive as it used to be. Um, so uh, a lot of times references made to ARP 1820. However, uh, not all the time do you have specimens that fit the ARP 1820 format for magnification of the surface of interest. So it's good to have some kind of fallback that's got a standard behind it. And one that I've used for a lot of years is ARP 1341 with a light load new. Uh, and uh, there's talk, it hasn't been uh, reviewed in quite a long time, so it's, it's really up for five-year review anyway. So that's going to uh, start down the uh, uh, review and perhaps revision path here over the next uh, upcoming meetings. If you're a ARP 1341 user and you have comments that you want to uh, uh, bring into the fold, uh, either come to AMEC or send them to AMEC or send them to me and we will carry them out to the review and see if it turns into a revision. Thanks for reminding me that. Yeah, awesome, Ed. That's great news. So, yeah. <clears throat> so I just the wanted... only other... Go ahead, Bob. Sorry, the only other thing with that AMS 2750G uh, that came out, yeah. uh, they did extend um, the tenth of a degree that one year time period. Yep. So... Um, you know, people that are looking for recording instruments to read it to a tenth of a degree, you got one more year. You got another year to do it. They they phased out all the analog stuff and all the paper chart stuff has been dropped. So, right out of the standard. Allow, right? Yeah, they did allow the uh, one tenth of degree uh, for recordings uh, for one more year till the end of June in 2023. Right. Fox counting. Right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks. Thanks, Ed. That's great. Great to hear all that stuff. Now let's switch over to the people who enforce the rules of AMEC, which is NADCAP, the super big checklist, everything going on there. And so Ed, I'll throw it to you and Bob to kind of walk through that. And I know we're going to have uh, Joanna and Lisa follow, uh, finish up with the uh, MMC report as well. So Ed, Bob, whichever one of y'all want to start the ball rolling. Well, I, I didn't go to London. I don't think Bob went to London. So I didn't go to London either. You know what? I, 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 the minutes I, aren't, aren't published yet. So I, I think, think we've got to lean on Johanna right now. I think we're going to just pull Joanna in right now. Joanna, are you there? <laughs> yes, I'm here. And although I did attend the London meeting, my time for the most part was monopolized by NMC attendance. Um, I did participate in the Heat Treat Task Group meeting because there were uh, ballot comment resolutions on the OP Appendix HT document. Uh, those were not of any major import. And most of the comments were editorial comments and there was a little discussion, but not much. Um, I guess if I had realized that Bob and Ed hadn't attended, I would have had my quality manager who did attend Heat Treat uh, give me more of an update or a recap. And as you said, Ed, I just checked eAudit.net and heat treat task group minutes are not posted yet, nor are any of the NMC minutes. So my usual emphasis on read the minutes, read, uh, access the presentations, watch everything that's going on in those presentations because there's a lot of good information in there. Um, I can't even do my rah-rah on that because there aren't any minutes posted yet. So I'll try and be quick, although there is a lot of NMC activity going on and I'm going to go basically chronological as those meetings were held. Uh, first was globalization and strategy and the FAI task group gave their update. It's a fairly new task group and have they have not conducted many audits up to this point, you know, partly because of the virus situation and partly because there aren't that many mandates for it yet. Um, another interesting development, additive manufacturing is currently under the auspices of the welding task group. That's the 7110 series of checklists. 
There are currently three additive manufacturing checklists and they are considering breaking additive manufacturing out into its own task group. That decision hasn't been made yet, but that is definitely up for discussion. Um, the next item that I participated in was the NMC member training. And although that presentation is only available under the NMC tab on eAudit.net, I'm hoping that the presentation will be, will be included as embedded in the minutes for, the, for that uh, event. Um, about two years ago, here I decided that it might be a good idea to train new members to NMC, because as we all know that there, recently there's been a high percentage of, retire, of retirement of longstanding, not just NMC members, but heat treat task group members. Um, and so they felt, you know, with all these new people coming on board, maybe we need to do a better job of explaining this whole process to them, because unfortunately, new NMC members are not just new to NMC, they are new to NADCAP in its entirety. That concerns me because we have people at a decision-making level who don't have very much, if any, experience with either NADCAP or NMC. And I just don't think that they're always aware of the ramifications of their decisions because they just don't have that time in service. So I urge everyone to take a look at that if it is indeed embedded in the minutes. Ethics and Appeals, that is a committee to which suppliers are not invited. So the best we can do on that is what? Read the minutes. <laughs> um, standardization, very much action going on, <clears throat> excuse me, in standardization. T form 1111, which is the notification of change document is under revision. There is some discussion on phrasing because there are things like significant changes to their quality staff or their quality system. Um, they haven't quite worked all the bugs out of that. The intent is to apply a risk assessment survey type of grading system on that T form 1111, which would then determine whether that supplier who has undergone either ownership or management changes would require another audit due to those changes. So that's significant if they decide to change verbiage on that form, because it may result in a new audit or some changes, which I believe may not warrant them, but I'm on that subcommittee as I am on so many others. And uh, I'm working to try and guide them in the right direction. Um, <clears throat> let's see. The issue with merit initiative. So to refresh everyone's memories, there were several OPs that were changed that would require that, <clears throat> excuse me, eAuditNet will now automatically issue an auditee advisory if the staff engineer and the task group chair have deemed those major findings for that audit have potential product impact. This has been a point of contention for a couple of years now, and there was something of a revolt, not this last Pittsburgh meeting, but the one before, the, previous Pittsburgh meeting. Um, and that is yet another sub, sub team that I'm participating in <coughs> because the staff engineers and task group chairs are rejecting those determinations of potential product impact to a very high percentage. In addition to that, it has represented a significant increase in workload for both staff engineers and task group chairs. And they're not pleased that they, by having to evaluate these major NCRs, that they are maybe acting on behalf of an MRB situation, and that's not sitting well either. In addition to that, because there has been such a high rate of rejection, both standardization and planning and ops has decided that there needs to be guidance, much better guidance 
for those decision makers as to why they are rejecting those automatic auditee advisories. As a corollary to that, there's again, another sub team um, that has been tasked with coming up with the de definition of the term potential product impact. There has also been non-compliance on the part of the staff engineers and the task group chairs to provide a rationale for why they have rejected issuing the automatic auditee advisory. So there's a lot going on with this merit initiative and I will keep you apprised as, excuse me, I have a helicopter going over. Just a moment, please, I'm sorry. Did you have a flyby for all those in the aerospace industry, Joanna? I'm sorry, Tom, what's that? I said, did you have a flyby yeah. by a helicopter for the aerospace people on this call? Somebody's buzzing the tower. <laughs> Better not be a drone. Right. <laughs> okay. Uh, audit exit form. There's a controversy because some task groups have a standard audit exit form. Some auditors use it, some don't. Is, do we want a standard audit exit form? I, the main objection was this. The current PRI official audit exit form includes phrasing at the bottom that says that the auditee accepts the NCR as opposed to acknowledges receipt of the NCR. So there's a sticking point there because we all know it's not uncommon for us to object to a finding and request that it be voided at some point. And so some auditors are falling back on that. Well, you agreed to it by the exit form. So that form will be undergoing revision also. Um, audit observations, yet another sub team that I will be participating in. Uh, they cited a specific example whereby the auditee said, uh, sure, we can have an observer, but he's going to be limited to the conference room. And in those instances, NMC, what exactly is the auditor, auditor and observer supposed to be doing? So there are some subscribers who believe that that should then result in a failed audit. There are others who don't agree. There are suppliers, of course, who don't agree that that should ever happen. So as that sub team makes its way through its task, I will, of course, be reporting back on that. Metrics. Metrics also has its own sub team to come up with definitions for those metrics that are currently being monitored. Um, there are no minutes for that sub team, but there is a presentation that should be embedded in the metrics committee minutes itself that will give you examples of those definitions that they are attempting to come up with. So I'll give you a quick example. Ballots, auditor interviews, and observation audits, and how they're going to be defined and equitable participation. So it's an ongoing project. I'll report as things develop. Uh, some, some of the interesting metrics your call, equitable participation is. NMC's attempt to monitor whether subscribers are fulfilling their obligations to participate in ballots, audit er interviews, and observation audits. Historically, the only one of those three metrics that is ever more than 50% is the auditor interviews. As it stands now, observation audits are somewhere in the 25% of their obligation, and ballots are somewhere in the neighborhood of 50%. So. NMC is attempting to improve those percentages and have been for quite some time, and uh, that effort will also continue. Customer satisfaction survey was submitted to suppliers, auditors, staff engineers, and one more category that's escaping me. And I'm on that analysis sub team, and we had our first meeting this morning, and that actually went very well. I will take a moment trying to be quick 
to encourage everyone when they receive a survey from PRI, whether it's from SSC or NMC or pick the body we want to pick on, um, I encourage everyone to respond because based on my experience with this this morning and in previous sub teams on the SSC side of things, these things really truly are looked at. They really do pay attention. They listen, uh, not surprisingly, most of the comments, not just from suppliers, but other entities within PRI. There's not good communication from NMC to all the rest of the stakeholders. And none of us are surprised at that. So because we reviewed comments today, we drilled down and please participate in those surveys. So Joanna, real quick question. What, what level and what type of questions are in those surveys traditionally? Is it about the audit process or about PRI's custom, customer service or what kind of questions are on those? All of the above. <clears throat> Let me tell you how this started. PRI a couple of years ago, no, not quite. June of 2021 meeting, <laughs> PRI made a presentation stating that they were, that it was their intent to become 9001 certified. As a result of that, there is of course all kinds of customer satisfaction requirements in that specification. And as of this last meet, the London meeting, they're not yet certified, but they are compliant. So it covers everything, Tom. The, the, it was a very broad gamut of questioning. And the questions in some cases were tailored to the recipients. So, mm -hmm. you know, supplier mm -hmm. questions were slightly different than those for staff engineers. Um, so it does, I think, actually cover a lot of a lot of bases. Do you so, find so you so y'all got to look at, at the actual comments and stuff? Do y'all feel like there was a lot of honesty in that? Because we've you know we've learned from listening to heat treaters about the surveys they do with their audits that they're really reluctant to say what's really on their mind or rate an auditor really how they perform. So you find that people are really honest and truthful on those. Well, as a matter of fact, that was one of the points of discussion this morning as it relates to the auditor feedback requirement on the part of the suppliers whereby they are unable to respond to their NCRs until they have indeed submitted that feedback. Mm -hmm. I did bring up that fact that there is reluctance on the part of the supplier base to be honest and forthright in that regard exactly for that reason. Right. They're concerned about mm -hmm. repercussions, retaliation, you name it. And I being me, I don't pull punches in that. And I would also encourage suppliers to do the same because based on my hour and a half sub team meeting this morning, we are drilling down to those comments. So I think they're paying attention to that. Well, and I mean, I, I don't know if they've looked at it, but I'd like to encourage you when in your next meeting is to ask them. I've always thought it was a good idea because uh, the reason they do that is because they they want to get the feedback and they hold the certificate hostage until they get the feedback. Because they say if they give the certificate before the feedback, they never get the actual feedback. <laughs> so, I mean, I think there's a happy medium for them to consider that they actually, you get your NADCAP, sort of, you pass, it's just like you just said, NADCAP is compliant but not certified. Well, you would get your compliance that you passed your NADCAP, but you don't get your certificate until you actually, you know, when, when all the um, NCRs are dealt with and, you, and you've passed, you then actually get told that, but you can't get your actual certificate until you get the feedback. Because I think it's a dangerous place to have surveys done prior to actually dealing with non-conformance issues, because that's what people just aren't going to be honest about. I completely agree with you. So mm -hmm. I'm hoping that as a result of this drilling down into comments this morning, because that was one of the things that we recorded as potential right. improvement is changing that process because of exactly those concerns expressed by suppliers. Well, I know with you on the committee, we have the right person in the right <laughs> spot saying the right thing. So I'm, I'm happy about that. Appreciate that. Well, thank yeah. you. I appreciate it. And you are a funny man, Tom. <laughs> Just make sure they set their goals high for customer satisfaction. Okay? Yeah. Right, yeah. right. No 60%. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> okay, don't get me started on the 50% right. now. All right, let's pull okay. that down back. Yeah. <laughs>
Um, I will say that they established a threshold. So if the score was anything below 80%, every one of those comments that were posted that skewed that result for that question down to below 80%, that's what we're looking at. So I think that's pretty good at 80%. For NetCap, how's that? Yeah, it's a good start for sure. <laughs> I see. They got, they got to have room for improvement. Yes. Right. See you chuckling, Ed. Okay, um, oversight committee, suppliers, another one of those where we are not invited to attend. Um, I personally believe that although suppliers should not have access to anything related to NCRs, that suppliers would be helpful when it comes to PRI's internal procedures and their document and data control and things such as that, that would have nothing to do with, auditee, with audits. Um, but it's been a pipe dream of mine since the Indianapolis meeting in July of 2004, but I keep hammering. Continuous improvement. Uh, let's see, metrics, continuous improvement. One of, the, one of the recognized flaws in this whole potential product impact situation with automatic audit advisories is the fact that although the audit advisories go to all subscribers, regardless of whether that's a specific subscriber was affected by that NCR, subscribers are not exhibiting reciprocity. What I mean by that is if subscribers themselves find during a process audit a major NCR, they are not willing to involve PRI in that. And I certainly understand it, but at the same time, PRI's position is, if you don't share it with us, we can't help you. So ongoing development. Uh, AC 7000, very, very important. AC 7000 is under revision right now. Um, there were some comments resolved at continuous improvement committee meeting. It will be going out for ballot shortly. I quite frankly expected to see it by now, but I have not yet seen. Um, there's a new section, fraudulent activity. And I personally have some concerns about the verbiage that's in there. And so, those efforts will continue. As a matter of fact, a prime approached me in the hallway and scolded me for not supporting him that there needs to be guidance for these brand new questions in the checklist. And I said, excuse me, I was in heat treat. I had to leave. I had ballot comments to resolve. No, I know you were there. You need to, you need to stand up and say something. <laughs> okay, like I don't do that. I wasn't there, I promise. So there are sub subscribers that aren't happy with the lack of guidance. That's not the only one that approached me. Um, and then there was another subscriber who is proposing that PRI assume the role of the enforcement of operational risk management, that uh, I objected to, of course, because I don't think that this should be under PRI's purview. It was accepted as a possibility of being addressed by, at least discussed to be addressed by PRI. And I will keep my fingers on the pulse of that one. Steering. Um, <clears throat> Scott Clavon gave a review of the current status of PRI's efforts to obtain more technical talent. As we all know, he treats specifically is always under the 130% capacity threshold that we're supposed to have, but it's not just auditor capacity at this point, in spite of having, I think, two new staff engineers for he treat. As far as the entire program goes, they're still understaffed and for staff engineers. Um, PD 1100, the document that governs the entire NADCAP process has been revised. So I encourage everyone to read that. I also encourage those of you who attend NADCAP meetings to please, please, there are nine task groups that do not have NMC reps out of 20. Nine of us don't have 
supplier voice on NMC. So I encourage everybody, please, you have other commodities besides heat treat, please participate. This is important and I'm going to be on the rampage to get more player participation. Uh, are, there any, are there, Jan, is there any particular ones that stand out that you would say, man, we need to get, get some on these two or three or are, they, are all of them the same level? I, I don't think there's a standout per se. I think okay. every task group should have a supplier rep to every NMC. Sure. Including first article, which is brand new. And certainly if additive, uh, excuse me, if additive manufacturing becomes its own task group, they need to have one too. That's gotta be a biggie for, for the heat treat community because that's gonna be a big one for yes. sure. Dale Harmon is the new SSC chair. Um, Fraudulent activity sub team. I explained to you AC7000 is going to be revised. Um, just to give you a quick recap, because I know I'm taking up everybody's time to give you an idea of what the difference is in terms of audit advisories. If, and here again, this will be in the presentation. Please review the minutes open the presentations that are embedded in those minutes. For heat treat, it went from 2016 to 21, 57, I believe it was 57 auditor advisories through May of this year, once this whole automatic started, 407. Wow. So okay. please okay. read the minutes. I can't stress that enough. Yeah, but they're not there. But not um, yet. <laughs> you know, the potential product impact thing, I thought we were just running to the old rules that we used to run for heat treat. We weren't going to abide by the new ruling. Well, that has been something, that has been part of the revolt that I had referred to earlier is that staff engineers and task group chairs were saying, not doing it. The problem is the workload still increases, whether they choose to accept that this is indeed worthy of an audit advisory or not. Just the sheer volume of those that have been passed on to go to the audit advisory stage. This should give you some concept of the workload that this has, the size of the workload increase that they're dealing with, okay? Right, so right. Part of the reason they, I'm sorry, go ahead, Bob. No, I, I, I certainly agree. And I think um, probably the staff engineer, he doesn't want to be the referee and make the call. He wants to just pass it along and let the uh, the prime make the call. Yes. But that's that same. So that's why they're increasing. Agreed. And that's also, I believe, would be the mindset of the auditor because the auditor doesn't want to suffer any Absolutely. repercussions because he didn't mark something in that fashion. So you have you have the motivation at the auditor level and you have the motivation at the staff engineer level and you have the motivate. So of course, okay. So- Right, uh, right. They're just gonna pass it along correct. and let the, uh, let the primes decide. And then the primes aren't happy with that because their workload is like horrendous then. Correct. And uh, one of the primes stood up and said, Last week, I counted last week, I got 140 emails from PRI. How can I manage that? And I was, I thought to myself, well, welcome to our world. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so yeah, it, it, I wonder if that even came up during the NADCAP meeting, because I'm sure they would have been talking about this in June. You mean at the heat tree task group? At the heat tree task group, right. Yes. Um, I will say the heat tree task group chair is also, in fact, insisted that he participate in the definition of potential product impact sub team. And I turned around and gave him the thumbs up and said, yay, <laughs> glad to have you aboard. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, and then we come to planning and ops, which for the most part is often just uh, 
you know, things that have been bumped up from those other committees up to planning and ops. Uh, standardization wasn't happy with the suggestion that there needed to be a sub team to come up with this definition of potential product impact. So it was kicked up to planning and ops and planning and ops said, well, yes, standardization, you may have come up with the definition during your efforts for potential or the uh, merit initiative, but I think I, we, Planning and Ops Committee believes that we need to do a better job. So I was happy to hear the Planning and Ops was in favor of that because the current definition as proposed by standardization is, could be better. How's that? Okay. And I am also on the sub tier for flow down or the sub team for flow down. Unfortunately, PRI does not recognize it as a continuing problem. I, on the other hand, completely disagree, as evidenced by the fact that MTI felt the need to come up with the purchase order checklist to help suppliers get the necessary information. Um, and we had very minimal participation on the part of those sub team members. And in spite of that, I'm still hammering. So how's that? <laughs> Yeah, that's great. That's another one I'm not saving on. And I think I've finished with four minutes to spare, giving no one else a chance to talk. Well, Joanna, you did at that, man, you're in the middle of a lot of stuff. I will say that. And I hope members appreciate the the leverage and the hammering that you're doing on their behalf to help make this, this process at NAGCAP a much more friendlier process than it ever can be. So appreciate the hard work that you're doing. Well, thank you very much. And I'm not the only one. I have a couple of colleagues, uh, supplier colleagues on NMC who are uh, also very active and do a good job of sometimes being the fly in the ointment, but we don't have enough suppliers. Right. We just don't. So I'm, in addition, oh, I might point something out. Uh, when PD 1100 was under re uh, revision a while back, I submitted comments that subscribers have alternate voting members on the NMC, but suppliers do not have that same privilege. I was actually successful in getting that change. So not only am I on the bandwagon of getting more suppliers as NMC members, I am also doing my best to get, to, sub, to conscript alternate supplier voting members so that if one can't make it, the other one can be there. So right. if you take advantage of this opportunity, we can double our representation there. Awesome. Hmm. So yeah, but would, that, uh, would that be applying just to, because they do it by company, right? So you have an alternate for your company. You don't necessarily have an alternate. Correct. So it's still company directed, right? Correct but it's still two voices and it's still double coverage if one can attend. Right. Agreed. Yes. So real quick, I know, I know, uh, Joanne, thank you so much for all that. So I know Ed posted, he's got some uh, comments real quick regarding management of change notices. So Ed, why don't you chime in that we're going to jump right to Chad Simpson, let him bring us up to speed on AS 13 100. Yeah, just real quick. Uh, this management of change uh, business T form 1111, uh, here at Solar, we had to move a satellite plant from one location to another, about a mile and a half down the road. And then at another facility, we added capability uh, to uh, uh, liquid quench, uh, as well as gas quench vacuum furnaces. In both cases, uh, the auditors arrived and they literally did not know what it was they were supposed to be looking at even though we went through the notification of PRI, the staff engineers submitted the forms, we're told we had to have auditors come in. Uh, when the auditors showed up, they were almost clueless as to what was going on. And I think part of that uh, management of change management at PRI has to be more targeted discussions at the time they quote whatever it is they think they have to do to audit your facility to keep your uh, accreditation in good standing. And they have to bring the auditor into the discussion so it's clear what's going to happen when he gets here. Uh, in both cases, there was frankly a lot more time uh, allotted to the work that was required to be done than we thought was necessary. 
but rather expensive. And uh, I really found it distressing that when the auditors got here, they were just about clueless as to what was going on. So uh, I, I'll throw that out to uh, Johanna because I know she's involved in uh, the, the uh, management of change uh, uh, business. Uh, there's there's a lot of broken pieces between the time a supplier turns the form in and the time an auditor actually shows up to do the work and it results in excessive amount of uh, auditor time being spent to do something that should be relatively simple. I'll just leave it at that. Well, I, I would like to supplement that a little bit, Ed. There was a, a consistent and alarming trend in the comments that we are reading from all four groups who received this customer satisfaction survey about the lack of communication between NMC and that group, whether suppliers, staff engineers, auditors. There was a disturbing and alarming trend that there's no communication is ineffective or non existent. That led to discussion about the sequence of auditor training coming before the NADCAP meeting versus auditor training coming after the NADCAP meetings, which Heat Treat Task Group has wanted for years to be reversed, whereby the Heat Treat and NMC meetings happen week one. And the following weekend, when the auditors are there, they get an update of what happened during all of those meetings. That came up this morning as a potential improvement for, to this communication problem. And that's, I think that's part of the problem exactly as you're describing, Ed, because that communication channel is not working. I would appreciate you bringing up that, that case study. I'm glad you're on top of that, Joanna. So now let's introduce Mr. Chad Simpson from Palo Products to bring us home with AS, or uh, what, AS1301? AS1300, yeah, you thanks, Tom. Uh, I'll try to be quick because I also have a meeting I gotta hop to. Um, you know, as far as AS1300, uh, again, those of us in the heat treat industry doing work for the aerospace engineer, engine manufacturers uh, as a major uh, addition to AS9100 uh, that will go into effect December, well, January 1st, basically. So by December 31st this year, you need to have all your uh, items in order. To start off with that, training is, is, is crucial. Uh, there's a four or a 10 hour training course. It's PD. 532104. Uh, that can be accessed through the aesq.sae-itc.com uh, website. That's a $399 per participant, and it's open to you for a year uh, after you open that. So that is the first key training that you need to conduct with at least have some of your uh, members in your organization, quality managers, et cetera, take that course. Uh, once you complete that, the, um, there's a GAP compliance assessment, uh, RM13009, also available on that AESQ site that you need to uh, do. It's basically a GAP analysis and checklist that you can perform for your organization um, you know, for the requirements of the AS13100 that you need to um, have an effect. Uh, along with that, you know, training wise, if you've not had the chance, you know, your organization and AS9100 is pushing some of this, but definitely 13100 is uh, AS9145 core tools training. Um, so any work you're basically doing that will involve APQP core tools, uh, MSA capability studies, and also linked with that is uh, 8D, you know, problem solving training and human factors training that you'll need to have implemented into your quality system uh, to be in conformance with, you know, AS13100. Uh, as Ed alluded to, Rolls-Royce uh, will be having a meeting in October. Uh, if you've not had any information on that, definitely reach out to your uh, contacts, you know, with, within your organization. Uh, another training that we're still trying to get some clarification from is uh, C1501. It's called the Common Training for DPRV Personnel. That's Delegated Product Release Verification Personnel. Uh, since most, or at least on the Apollo side, most of the work that we do is not directly released uh, to the aerospace manufacturers. It's not necessarily applicable to us at this point, but that is something you need to make sure you're communicating with your Customers, uh, especially if it's potential product that you're releasing back to 
uh, a direct engine manufacturer. More than likely not, but something to definitely review for your system. If they have it to where you can release that product directly without um, you know, a, another step in the supply chain, uh, something for you, you'll probably have to uh, conduct. Um, if you're wanting to have an outside authority uh, come in and audit your system, uh, as Johanna alluded, they're already short auditors, so I don't know how they're going to uh, supply this, but PRI Registrar uh, does have, supposedly, I've not contacted them directly, but they do have a uh, item on their PRI Registrar site that they will conduct audits for AS13100. Uh, it will not be a certificate, as of course this is not a certified standard at this point. Uh, but they will come in and basically do probably more of an in-depth gap analysis, um, issue potential NCRs and help you in closing those out to show your conformance um, to the standard. Like I said, not required. Uh, I don't have major in-depth knowledge, but that is a, a potential that you can have somebody come in externally to review for you. Uh, that's what I have at this point. Any questions? Sounds like that's it, Chad. All right. Yeah, no, that's still strictly for um, aerospace engine manufacturers. Is that correct? Or is it expanded into um, a broader area? No, correct at this time, Bob, Bob good question. AS13100 um, is just for aerospace engine manufacturers. Um, now, uh, AIA, the Aerospace Industry Association, is potentially looking to uh, adopt a similar standard, either take AS13100 or create their own standard that would potentially affect any type of aerospace work. Uh, that is probably looking more towards 2024 to 2025, but that is a committee I'm on. And uh, right now it's in a little bit of a holding pattern at this point, but that is a potential for all of us. Okay. Thank you for that, Chad. I appreciate you keeping up on and what's going on with that. Yes. Yep. Thank you. All right, well, everybody, thank you so much. Everybody on this team, I wanna just communicate to everybody listening in and listening after we get, the, get it out on the website tomorrow that we really appreciate the work you're doing. Everybody that's online, these people go to these meetings at their company's expense and are doing this to represent one, their company, but bigger picture represent the industry and create a great place for all y'all to come to work. So appreciate the work they're doing. I want to have everybody mark August 11th on their calendar. The economy is going like this and going crazy. And so we have our next sales forecasting ITR economic uh, forecast on August 11th at 2 p.m. You'll be getting a notice on that. And don't forget to put FNA 2022 on your calendar to see the latest in trends and technology in Indianapolis, Indiana, the Heat Treat uh, Furnace North America show. So everybody, thank you so much for being here. We love you and, and, and glad you're a member of the Metal Trading Institute. And we'll see you soon. Have a good day. Yeah. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.